Uh, I've been a developer on the LabVIEW team for 20 years. Uh, worked on basically every part of it uh, at some point. Um, but the things I'm most known for are obviously the Q palette, which is the very first thing and is where my handle comes from. Um, and then all of the OO features. I've been the lead designer and architect for uh, all of those for the last 15 years. The last year, this, this, the, you know, since November of, of 2020, I've been on a bit of a sabbatical, uh, working as a full-time G programmer, uh, first for Blue Origin and currently for Microsoft. So um, I've been a little bit more down in the trenches than I've been in the past, and I finally get to use this language that I've been building, that I, you know, I kind of built for myself. Um, and so that's been really nice. Along the way, um, I've been thinking a lot about some of the little low-level pieces over the years, and this is a a collection of stuff that uh, focuses on, oh, that's, that's probably not the right title. Um, it's more the ways of our errors that I want to talk about and, and what we do with those. Now, before I get into the meat of this presentation, there are two topics that I, I want to jump into. Uh, the first is I am very grateful to be able to have an in-person conference. Um, I have not really liked the virtual presentations and the lack of feedback and being able to see faces when they're confused. Um, and it's kind of lonely sitting at your table, even when people are cheering online. So I am thrilled to be here, and I'm very grateful um, for, for, for everyone, uh, specifically the hygiene that I've seen around here. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the graph today. We are on a good trajectory. Thank you all, and I, and I really appreciate that we're able to do this. And if we can just keep up the, the efforts and you know, encouraging people to get vaccinated and keeping the masks on, hopefully next year we don't have to worry about this. So thank you for the organizers. The second piece is our giants are female. This is Dr. Deborah Tritton. Uh, as I'm supposed to call her these days, Deborah, that took a few years to transition. She was my mentor in college, um, one, one of my two. Um, and she was my, my, my course advisor. She did data structures, computer graphics, pedal recognition, but her biggest area of research, um, at, you know, it was a minor piece at the time, but has become more and more, is literally how to teach computer science. And she does qualitative research studies on, you know, uh, she'll literally do A-B teaching on her data structures course for a bunch of freshmen and then see where the grades come out. And she'll do different types of you know, styles over different, several years with different professors teaching different ways and looking at you know, retention rates and, and overall graduation rates. She has a wealth of data on what, how do you actually get people. And one of her, her you know, big things has been elimination of some of the structural barriers for women and minorities um, and just recognition of you know, where textbooks are always using a male as the example user or something like that. And the one that kind of hit home for me was her, her work on how to tame what at the time she called smart cowboys. Uh, those of us who came in with a bit more knowledge than our peers, a real passion for it, some na native skill, and maybe some thought that we didn't really need the rest of the people around us. Um, and uh, one of the best quotes, um, in the real world, you will work mostly in teams, get used to it. Uh, she said this to me point blank uh, when she declared that 50% uh, of our grade for the course would now be tied to the lowest person in the class. Um, and uh, suddenly we were very interested in tutoring and we accused her of you know, just tying her hands and she pulled out the data book that she'd been working on and walked us through the graphs where uh, every class that she had done this on, the grades for not just the lowest folks, but the highest folks had all moved up by a full grade point. So. She has her data, and she's, she's been very inspirational for me. So the teaching that I do to you is in large part because of what she taught me about how to teach. And that comes on top of my CS degree. So without further ado, let's teach. There are two themes that I'm going to cover today. And the first one is that there is nothing special about error data. We're going to talk about it. As, as, as a cluster and the fact that we could represent errors in lots of different ways. We handle it like data, it moves around. It's really, it's just data and we put a little too much specialness in sometimes into treating it as sacrosanct and you, know, you must do these in these ways. The second theme that I wanna focus on 
is that error data is absolutely the most special data in your application. <laughs> and I'm going to need you to hold these twin ideas in your head because the representation of the data is not necessarily what is the high piece, but the thing that the data represents is what's critical. And, and we're going to explore this. I'm going to offer you some tools at the end of this, but my hope is that most of what you take away from today's presentation is questions and maybe a little bit of guilt that is just enough in the back of your mind that makes you look at your diagram and goes, am I really doing this right? Yeah, I'm doing it right. Am I really doing it right? Yeah, I'm really doing it. That's what I, that I want you riding that edge of paranoia. All right. We're going to play a bit of a game to open up. Uh, so what is an error? The first thing we want to say is uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of functions. And, you're going to, and they, they're each going to return either some output or an error. And you tell me if they're doing the right thing. So we have a function wash dishes. It takes a load of dishes as an input, and it returns clean dishes. The wash cycle takes about two hours. All right. So what happens inside the function in the first case? All the dishes were cleaned in 118 minutes. And it returns no error. Seems reasonable. That's what it's supposed to do. That's the pretty obvious case. The next one is there's a water outage. And while we were running, we ran out of water. And it says, error, no water. Pretty obvious, it couldn't complete its task. OK. Electrical failure, same thing. No power, didn't get the dishes washed. Great. All the dishes report successfully cleaned in 63 minutes. And it reports it as no error. Is that correct behavior? Should it report, should it have returned an error? Should it, I mean, they said they were clean. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what, I'm gonna, what my think, thinking is on this. We're going we're gonna to move forward a little bit. Um, the last one is. We, the user started the run without detergent. And it throws an error and says, nope, I can't run. There's no detergent. Is that right? Nope. Why not? Uh, you, might simply want rent. you might simply want rent. So this, this, is this wrong behavior? I'm not going to answer that question yet. We'll come back. All right. I got, I got, I got two more of these. Um, now, that, that last one about detergent, actually, um, it actually is correct behavior if you are canon who is right now, uh, the situation is you're out of ink and you want to scan, and they are now facing a major lawsuit because they disable all the functions if you haven't bought more ink. Uh, so maybe your dishwasher manufacturer wants to sell detergent, and that's how they're making their profit on their dishwashers. So you shouldn't probably not apply at Whirlpool. <laughs> My point is, take this with a grain of salt when we assert these things, the first little hint of where my, my argument is going is he's coming at it from a particular perspective on whether or not that should be an error or not. All right, the next one. We are going to zoom in on brightest star. So this function is supposed to take an image as input and return either an image or an error. So the first, yeah, I hope you can see that there's a bright spot in some of these. So the first one, it comes back and says, yes, I found the star, zoomed in, look, oh, it's pretty. And then the second one, it comes in and says, yep, oh, I found one. This one, this one's nice red. It's going the other direction. Great. The third case, there's an error. No stars detected. Is that reasonable? Why not? OK. So it shouldn't have returned an error. It should have just returned another black image. That would have been the brightest star. Would have been legit to just return a black image? The last one, there are no bright stars. All of the stars have exactly the same magnitude, and yet it picked one and returned it. Is that right behavior? Well, it turns out that this is drawing a little bit on a real world example. Um, in this case, it's an application that's going to be calling this, and there's this button, zoom in on brightest star, and it could have been spec'd out as when you click this, what we want to get is you know, an error box that says no stars detected. But in this particular case, the way the application actually works is that button, it does a pre-scan of the image to rule out all of the bad cases and grays out the button. The actual zoom in function 
is never even called in the, in the bad cases. So this caller didn't care what the function did in the no stars and all stars of the same magnitude cases. It ruled those out a priori in the, in the caller's code. So what, did, what the programmer decided to do inside the function, this particular application didn't care. And there's your next hint. So he came at it from a particular perspective of what was correct on the, on the dishwasher. What was correct for this function? Well, he was kind of free to handle the case. So you, you know, you probably shouldn't just crash in case of one of those cases comes in, but the design of the application was do what you will. So he did something that seemed reasonable. Now I got another function, break bill into coins. This one, you send in a bill and you get coins back. And so in this case, I've got four identical inputs. I, I put a bill in and voila, four quarters drop out. Seems like a reasonable result. Great. The next time I do it, I get two quarters and five dimes. Still, we're, we're, we're all good and that's, that's a reasonable count. The next time though, it says no coins available. I've run out of coins. Seems appropriate rather than just returning no coins, right? giving an error back, gives some feedback to the user about the current state of the system. Then I do it a third time, or a fourth time, and this time I get back 86 cents in euros. And maybe it even little gives me a little card that says it was the, here's the exchange rate. Is that correct behavior? Did the function do the right thing? Well, we don't know exactly what was specified as the job of this function. And sometimes we want to push on functions to say, look, you do whatever the heck you can to avoid an error situation, to make it to your deliverable. And sometimes that results in some really weird things happening on the corner and edge cases. And we'll see this a lot in deterministic programming where we're like, you have to meet this time spec. And the 80% case, which we expect to always be the case, has got all sorts of reasonable things. You get close to that border, we're going to return random numbers. We're going to skip entire functions, just blow past them because it's far more important to meet that timing spec. Sometimes you get these overriding constraints that are like, look, I need, I need you to give me coins. I don't care because you don't always know what's going on. So maybe this code gets rewritten to simply do a long delay and it just sits there and waits until somebody fills in coins or it sends some guy out to go beg on the street until it's got enough coins and then it returns them to you. And you, you call the function and you, get, you are guaranteed to get coins. Sometimes that's a desirable behavior because you don't always know, maybe you're not getting coins in order to spend them. Maybe you're a referee who just has a dollar bill and needs a coin because you're about to go into a FIFA major game and you don't have a coin for the coin flip. And so you, you need a function that's just going to handle that. Whether or not the function returns an error has an impact on the caller. So if I have a function that, that could return errors, I have to write it differently. I write a loop and I say call break into coins. And if I don't get a, uh, if, I, if I get no error, then I, I go ahead and use it because all I really need to do is take first coin, give to referee. But if, I, if it says I get an error back and it says I don't have any coins, well, I'm going to just keep calling you until you give me back a coin because I don't have any other way of getting a coin. This is a more complex piece of code than if I've written the subroutine to say, it's gonna take care of it and always you're guaranteed to get a coin somehow. Because now I can just code this as call break into coin, take first coin, give to referee. And I'm, I'm scot free. What you're gonna find if you start really looking at air wires driving through code is that whether or not a function returns an error radically can change the caller code. And it can do this in subtle ways. There's a big long blog post I have when I, when I was <clears throat> tasked with the assignment of rejecting the most highly codosed idea ever on the idea exchange of adding the error, uh, error terminals to the wait milliseconds. I think Zoom is now past it. Um, but wait milliseconds getting error terminals, we rejected. And part of that rejection, if you read the report, was People, when we were trying it out or when we looked at different statuses, they were serializing it instead of letting it run in parallel. It was making them think, oh, I need to wire up these air wires. And it had this psychological impact of they just couldn't leave it alone. 
Um, and we saw this with a bunch of other functions that didn't need air terminals, which is what made us pretty confident would happen with the, air, with the weight milliseconds. When you have something that can return an error, you have to raise a whole bunch of retry cases like, like this. You have to worry about how are you reporting that to the user, um, and suddenly your entire user interface has to make space for another, at least an LED that turns red. When we start really looking at errors, what we're going to find, I think, if you look at it through the same, you know, same depth of code that I look, have started looking at it, or started years ago looking at it, is they can drive whole program architectures to change. An easy example for me to point out is what happened to channel wires. Jeff K invented channel wires, gets full credit. Um, Jakob Kornerup figured out, you know, and Steve Rogers figured out the details of getting them all working nice. But I tried, I was the first user on them, and I came back and I said, we can't, this can't work because we don't have enough back propagation for, for the abort signal and for, for what happens when things go wrong. And they were designed strictly for deliver data. And once we started saying, how do, I get the, how do I get an error here to cause the previous loop to stop, the whole architecture fell apart. And we had to actually redesign channels from the ground up to be able to say, they have to be able to do back propagation in order to be useful. They changed fundamentally an entire language feature because we needed errors to go the other direction in most use cases. This is something you're going to notice. And so when I've been encouraging people to leave errors off, I've been, I've been sort of light on this. I talk about some performance impacts. I talk about you know, readability. I, don't, I can't point to hard data. I can't you know, cite sources, and I can't really show you the impact it's having on your code. But on case-by-case -case bases, I can see whole architectures that are just off kilter because you're trying to carry an error around that really shouldn't be there or you're chaining things in weird ways, trying to move the errors through it. So be aware that this is where we're, what we're heading for. In fact, you know, and, and sometimes you're like, well, actually, I do want it to return an error sometimes, because maybe I actually don't want this to be an infinite loop. If it doesn't return an error, and if it says, I will guarantee you that you're going to get a, a valid result no matter what they do, and I will take as long as it takes, you can't do this after three tries return an error. So whether or not it's doing the right thing and what you need it to do, well, that's not, it's, you're, you're making your decision as your caller. The function is doing the right thing by definition. That's what it does. That's what it declares in its, in its context help. That is its co contract. If you give me a, a, a picture with no stars in it, I will return you an error. Whether that's right or wrong is, well, yes, that's right, but it depends on the context because the caller and different callers can have different perspectives. Alan and you know, Whirlpool having very different position, you know, positions on whether a dishwasher should be able to run without detergent. I don't actually want to blame Whirlpool, especially if any of those are my customers, because I don't know that they're behaving the way Canon is. And we don't even know if it's, there's at least a couple of engineers at Canon who claim it's actually a, just a bug. Um, they wired their air cluster to one too many places. Um, so we'll see. That's a whole lawsuit proceeding. But the point is, um, the rightness or wrongness of propagating an error depends on what the caller is going to need. And you should be looking at the caller environment when you're trying to decide what these functions need to do, and possibly having different versions of the same thing, one that guarantees correctness, one that you know, and is, is a nice wrapper around the lower level function that you know, does error running with. So I hand Jim. Did you mention the uh, delay propagation malleable VI that I think it was Jeff, at least that I first saw that. Oh. It, it's basically like a wait milliseconds and you put in the weight and you just wire anything yeah. through it and it can be an air wire, it can be anything else. I did not get into that one. Okay. Um, it's a it's a it's a different a different function in the palettes. Well, um, I'm just saying that that addresses the use case that a lot of people have, which is I want to delay, but I want true. the delay after this thing happens before this thing happens, which is like control flow. Right. And because it's not tied to specifically the error cluster database. Yeah. It yes, it solves it solves the use case without actually answering the idea. So it, the idea was a very specific solution. Anyway. Yeah. We can talk about it. that later. Um. 
So what constitutes an error, whether or not it is an error, is really you know, the function's decision of when, what, what, am, what, what, what am I choosing to return? Errors are only errors from the point of view of the sender or the subvi's po point of view. The, the subvi says, well, I don't know how to complete this function that I'm supposed to do, so I'm making the decision to return an error. Whether or not that's really an error at the caller level is, a, is an open question. I can have a, you know, uh, different things that you know, can go wrong in my system, and from the caller point of view, they're like, well, that's not an error, that's just an expected scenario. Why did you return that in an error cluster? Just give me that as a, you know, as a, as a Boolean or a string that tells me that this happened or some other form of notification. Why did you put that in the error cluster? I have to now filter it out of my error stream. Um, well, the function said, I have a task to do and I couldn't complete it. So we're gonna work with this as the definition of error, at least for this presentation. An error is an indication that a function could not complete its assigned task. And that's all it really is. It's, it's saying, you told me to do something and I couldn't. And ultimately I fell down on the job. All right, so if that's our definition of error, now I wanna focus specifically on the error clusters within, within our language. So why is it an error cluster? I mean, if, you, if we look at this, we, we, we have this no stars detected, no coins available. We could, we could use an error ring and we could return no error or no stars detected, or we could use an enum and output zoom was successful, no stars detected. You could argue that this is better because no error, as we're propagating it forward or wiring it to a case structure, we're not really sure what it is. It'd be nice to read in the case structure, zoom successful. That's you know, self-documenting code. Um, we could come down here to this case and we could say, well, we could return either no error or no coins available, or we could just have another output that is number of coins. And if it happens to be zero, well, obviously there's no, Coins. I don't have to supply additional information. The fact that I couldn't give you coins is right there in the return result. Why do I need this other, other information to, to convey it? Well, you know, um, and, if, and then if we want to go a little bit further, we could say, well, oh, well, the, the, the error cluster lets us the, you know, fold in this warning information. Well, that's true. We could represent that in another way. We could add another element to the enum. We could add a Boolean that says, you know, we, we did some exchange of coins as part of this transaction. What, you know, the representation of this information as an error cluster, why? What, what compels us to put this type of data into that data structure? Propagation Unified type benefits callers. That fundamentally is why we keep coming back to this standardized type is because we really don't care why you couldn't do your job. We don't look inside the air cluster. All we care about is that Boolean really. And when we get to the next function, if it was successful, then he'll run and he'll either be, and we get all the way down. And it, at the end down here, we care that somebody failed, but along the way, we don't really. And so we propagate, we use this as a shortcut for being able to propagate information. And so we're not like having to test, well, how many coins were returned as a separate case structure around all of the downstream code. This gives us an escape valve for minimizing our wiring on the diagram. And we can pack a lot of metadata into that cluster. We can talk, we can fold in a timestamp. You know, we've a uh, timestamp or, or other little pieces of information can go in that cluster along the way. That's actually what we teach in the actor framework about the error wire and the error cluster coming out of the methods of an actor. It's not an error wire. It is the request to stop wire with information in it about why we are stopping. And then the, the actor's main, you can handle that and handle error, or you can pass that information to the caller and it can do something intelligent with why this actor stopped. But it's not a oh my God, error, we have to propagate. It's just a, re it is actually a request for something downstream to take action. Correct. And we, we, we use this error cluster information. Um, and sometimes we lean on it a little too much. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. But when, I, when you are looking at your errors and you're trying to decide, am I going to return this you know, in the error cluster or am I going to return it in other parameters? One of the biggest things to look at is how soon is someone going to have to make a decision on that information? That 
you know, current exchange currency Boolean as opposed to folding it in as a warning. If I say there's exchange currency in here, that's probably something someone's going to need to act on right now. And they, you know, they, they, they probably want to evaluate that specific aspect of this return value pretty quick. So it makes sense to say that's going to be a specialized output. It, not only does it, you know, it, it's right there and we can see it. So I'm going to pull that out of the air cluster. I'm going to represent that specially. But if I'm like, yeah, it's something that I could wait three days until it finally gets to a log file and someone checks it eventually, maybe I leave it in the air cluster. Again, I'm mostly raising questions, not giving you answers. Roy Foltzasek was my first manager at National Instruments. Sorry. Yes, yes. Um, I was about to be on Brian's team, but I got assigned to Roy's first. Um, and uh, Thanks, Roy. yes, Roy was arguably the single best manager I've had in my career. Um, and most of us who've worked for him have similar opinions. And he was, you had to be, you, you, we were in charge of making sure he got to meetings on time because he had no ability to maintain a calendar. But I, uh, assuming you took care of that part, he's a great manager. Um, and he had a lot of advice, especially for, for younger engineers that were starting out in our career. And one of the best things that he said, I don't know how many times, the computer knows what went wrong. Be sure to tell the user. It's amazing how often that we can, uh, well, file not found. Oh, you want the path to the file. Right, well, we'll wait 23 years between the introduction of the air cluster and the fixing of that error message. <laughs> but it has it now, so it's all good. Um, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the computer, it faulted for a reason. It put that error code in for a reason. It grabbed the call chain for a reason. Somebody write down the reason. Uh, and often, the error code is sufficient. And in fact, in, we write our RT and FPGA systems so that the code is sufficient. And we sometimes will create on FPGA whole lists of codes because that's really all we can return is that integer because there's no, there's no string handling down there. We don't have the bandwidth, et cetera. Um, and sometimes over network communications, you're trying to pack in you know, very tight. Uh, sometimes you have localization problems where you return the code and it's only on the receiver system where we're gonna translate that code into whatever language the person is reading. Um, and so those error codes are very valuable. But when we can pack in additional information, like the path, we, we, we want to do that. Um, so this error cluster, why is it an error cluster? Because it carries around a string. Because just returning a code and saying, if it's zero, it's not an error, and if it's an anything non-zero, it is an error, isn't necessarily enough information. Unless you're gonna create an error code for every possible file. I don't know, it's probably a bad architecture. Someone should try it. Um, right, see? Errors typically change as they ascend the call. So I said, you know, whether something really is an error or not, it depends on the point of view of the, uh, you know, the, the receiver. The sender says, this is an error. And that, and that is true, it couldn't do its job. When it gets to the receiver, they're like, well, well yeah, but, but really? Um, and, and that varies. I don't know how many people have ever read For One of a Nail. It shows up in most schools. We don't know who wrote it. It's anonymous. It comes, uh, it's centuries and centuries old. Um, for one of a nail, the shoe was lost. For one of the shoe, the ho horse was lost. For one of the horse, the rider was lost. All the way down until, and for one of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Well, when an air cluster is returned from that deep file not found function, and it comes all the way up through the ranks, sometimes you want that lowest level piece of data, as in you don't want attack failed to be coming out of execute battle plan. What you'd like is could not find horseshoe nail, because that is an actionable message that you might be able to go, I have a nail, take it to the battlefield, and we'll rerun execute battle plan and it'll pass this time. The metaphor may be stretched a little thin, but you bear with me. Um, but sometimes that error message comes up through the ranks and you're like, run nuclear power plant. And you get the error message, temperature sensor overload, replace sensor. When what we really wanted to come out is reactor meltdown in progress, evacuate. 
I did recently, well, about three years ago, get to look at the source code for a nuclear reactor. It's fascinating what can get regulatory certification. And you could, they had proof that it worked. That was the best part. Like they had, wow, I was really impressed. Um, it, cause it was viable, workable code and got signed off on, but architecturally I was like, wow. Um, and one of the things they had in there was a bunch of places where they were elevating their error codes into more and more helpful messages. So this isn't entirely a fictitious example. I didn't see this particular error message. Um, but my point remains, sometimes it's just fine to return that low level message all the way through, but sometimes they need to be rewritten. So you need to think about it. Really frequently in our code, we return an error cluster and we return the error cluster and we chain it along and we return it to our caller and then we ship it across the network and then we run it on the host and we end up at the end user and the general error handler pops up and it goes, garbage gook on system you don't even know exists has a problem. Great. Well, I'll call somebody and see if anybody in this company knows what a garbage gook is. You know, and, and when you're in a company like National Instruments and you've got stuff routing from a device driver through test stand, bank shot into LabVIEW, you're like, I, I honestly don't know what system went wrong here. And so we, pay, we start paying attention to these errors and we start saying, look, at every boundary, well, maybe we want to do something a little different. So, for example, we uh, have a run machine. And we're going to set the temperature uh, within that, that environment. And that's going to kind of turn around. This is a call chain. It's going to turn around and call turn on cooler. And that's going to turn on spin motor. Well, great. Spin motor decides to return an error. There's an electrical short, which means turn on cooler is going to return error electrical short in compressor motor. And that's important because an air conditioner frequently has two motors, one for the fan and one for the compressor. And now you know which one. Oh, okay, because there's context here. And if we just returned short in motor, we're right off the bat, we don't know which motor we're talking about. And we get up to the next level and the next guy is like, oh, well, actually, okay, I, I see that you have an error, but that's not even really an error for me because I'm gonna call turn on backup via, uh, you know, the turn on backup and run the separate cooling system. And as soon as that comes on, I'm returning nowhere. Because yes, sure, there was a fault down there, but it's not a fault from my point of view. So I return it on up and run machine continues running blissfully unaware. As you're returning your errors, think. Take a moment to ask yourself, it's been 20 nodes since the last time anyone looked at this error cluster is now a good time to maybe rewrite it in terms of the next caller up? Um, think, you know, and I, I can't give you hard lines in the sand of where the right places in your code are. I'm gonna have some suggestions in a little while of places to look. But what I really want you to do is think. Now, I, I mentioned before that the error cluster can cause significant variations in your code. Small changes in requirements can lead to significant architecture changes. So in this example, all of a sudden we want a, an LED Boolean on the front panel that says running, whether or not we're running on the backup cooler. And you're like, well, set temperature doesn't even say whether or not it's running on the back. It returns no error. There's no information about that. Well, this new UI thing means I need to return no error and a string that says backup activated. And, whoops, and, and, and now, I, I can, you know, now the machine can go on running, a, but it's now got this extra piece of data. And the question is, is no error plus backup activated string, does that mean we should just make it a warning and return it in the error cluster? Well, that would mean we don't have to change the con, the con pane of the sub VI. There's some nice things about that. Um, we can just, fold, it's got a string in there, it might as well use it, right? We're carrying around that string pointer for a reason. Put some text in there. Hey, it's been it's back to activated. Caller can now dig that information out. Raise your hand if you would put this in as in a warning in this case. Oh man, most of you, I've got the right answer at least in my opinion. Now, this is my opinion. It's an opinion that I've gotten fairly wide buy-in at National Instruments for. We try to avoid warnings, um, and we've gotten rid of them in just about every API. 
um, except for like, I think there's two drivers that have, still have warnings in them. Um, and those are historical and harder to, harder to change. But I wouldn't make this a warning. And the reason I wouldn't, well, first of all is I've got a bunch of things that might be warning cases. Backup activated, fan rattling, filter needs, needs changing. I may need to return multiple messages simultaneously. If I've got an air cluster, even if I have one of the modern ones like we got in LabVIEW 2020 that allows you to put compound messages in, it's not really a good you know, data structure for parsing and for handling and even investigating whether there's multiples in there. Oh, you mean when the multiples are piled in? No, no, no not, not the multiple errors. Oh, the yeah. The call chain. Yeah, never ever, source is a, is a historical misnomer. There is metadata galore that can get shoved in that, in that string. Um, and so, yeah, it set the label, it's, you know, uh, the, the, what is it, status, code, source. Source just means this is not a human readable string. Use an interpreter to figure out what's in here, i.e. general error handler. Um, or some of the other tools. Um, so you may need multiple together, and this is not really a good vehicle for returning multiple. I'd rather have a, an actual output that is, here's an array of all of the multiple things that are, you may need to know about. Errors, there's typically one error. That is a big aspect of any particular stream. This is the error that matters. This is the one that stopped the system. This is the one that froze us out. Parallel chains coming together, sometimes you'll start stacking multiple together, and we have facilities for, dealing with that, but that's, you know, that, that is a fairly specialized case. And even in the cases of multiple coming together, there's usually one that is primary. And there's, the, there's a reason we have them in a sort order. And like I said, have you ever tried to parse an air cluster string? Like if we were to pack all those strings in as, you know, things, it's not, it's meant to be a human readable. It's meant to be a display string. It's not meant to be a machine readable parse thing. And we can pack machine readable parse strings in there and we can do it, but that starts getting into specialized tools and interpretations and everything else. It's not a good vehicle for warning information by and large. Also, you remember that little bit where I said that we want to handle things, you know, when information is going to be handled immediately local, it's usually better to put it on the con pane because then it indicates to the caller, this is something to pay attention to. It's like a, a bright red call out. Well, it also, means you know, you, you're consciously seeing, oh, there's a terminal there and I'm gonna go ahead and use it. But it also has to do with the fact that warning information is usually only, and I say this having looked at a lot of diagrams looking at warnings, it's only matters right there. If you drop warnings on the ground after that first return point, almost no one downstream ever cares about it. It's like literally right here at this moment, make a decision, is this an error for you? Or is this an, you really don't care? And you make that decision on that information. Embedding it in the error cluster just clutters your error cluster and makes following what the air wire is doing harder to understand. So my general thing is I would say no here. And I'll talk more about warnings that we get to the end. So the conclusion that I'm gonna say here is the errors are not special. It's just a cluster. It used to be a pink wire for many years. Um, we had the little INI token that was added in LabVIEW 6 that would allow you to make it a yellow wire. And then we decided to make that true because we wanted to see it on diagrams. But it is just a cluster. Um, you can take any cluster you want. And if you put a Boolean and co a code and a, and a string in it and you, you, know, you don't even have to name them right, it, it's, that's the type. You can pack a lot of information into this cluster for good or for ill. You can abuse it just like you can abuse any piece of data. It's, it's data. I, you can have sub VIs that return status in addition to or instead of the error cluster. There's nothing sacrosanct about the error cluster. There's no rule that says all sub VIs must have it, despite the fact that many new LabVIEW users think that. It's simply often needed. So a lot of templates will put it in there because it's easier to delete the terminals than it is to add them and connect them up to the con pane. But you don't necessarily need it. Don't pay for it if you don't. It's just a status message. That's, at the end of the day, all it is. So don't treat it as special. When you're trying to figure out what to return out of the sub-VI or 
from a module on across the network, don't assume that it should be packed into the error cluster, even if it's a mistake, even if it is, you know, DAC card on fire, there may be cases where you're like, I would rather report that as a separate terminal because I really want to make sure that people re recognize that DAC card on fire is a potential problem of this system and they better wire it. Um, sometimes it's useful to call that out at that level. Sometimes you wanna just fold that into the air cluster. Think about it. Most of the time you're gonna fold that sort of thing into the air cluster because it's an error, that's our standard error handling pattern, et cetera. But think. All of this thinking and that I'm trying to get into your head and, and oh, okay, I'm gonna think about it some more, is leading me in the direction of something that I've over the last three or four years been calling error-driven design. Um, the actor framework, we had to change it a few times as it, I, you know, some of you in the community were watching me develop it on the forums. Like I would post, here's my daily work, here's what I've got, here's what I, didn't work with Alan, et cetera, et cetera. Give me feedback on systems you've got. Um, and when we started talking about the error behaviors of it, we tried several variations and some of those variations resulted in whole different organizations of the VIs and, you know, wholesale changes. As I just mentioned, the channel wire example, in order to do that back propagation or do the air, get error systems, we had to introduce a whole back propagation aspect. There's a lot of architecture that I've seen that shifts. And that leads me to this, that errors are the single most special data type. What makes them so special? Well, the first is the biggie, error information is likely to create a data dependency from the bottom of your app to the top. Of all the pieces of information that you might want to get from the lowest thing all the way to the top, that you might have to create terminal, connect wire, create terminal, connect wire, and drill all the way through, it's the error information. It's the flaw in the system that keeps the thing from doing its job that you ultimately have to tell the user about somehow. And just silently saying it failed is usually not acceptable. And so that one mistake, that one bit of nope, yep, nope, yep, having to get that from the bottom of your FPGA through the RT system onto the host, across the network, to the server, and report it in the management report three days later can completely keelhaul every piece of design you've got. It adds a case structure into a whole bunch of places where otherwise it's a nice laminar flow. And suddenly you've got extra bits that you were like, I could have fit this whole information in one you know, floating point number, but no, you gotta you know, have all this extra data. It's a big deal. And it can really ruin your day when someone says, oh yeah, that can fail. Um, error code paths are, the, are often underspecified. You read a spec document, um, I've seen this occasionally in even like, like the CLD specs, like here's your, you know, we want you to write this project. Um, and they spend a lot of time giving very fine grained detail on what those projects are supposed to do. Sometimes you just forget about the error case. Like what should it do when something breaks? That's, human brains don't think about that for some reason. There's a, there's a bunch of research into why that is. And we don't like to dwell on the negative cases a lot of times. And if you look at specs, I've seen them at customer sites all over the world as I've traveled. Error data is frequently not in the plan. And so it's special because you have to think about it on your own. And you're like, I don't have guidance. And my customer hasn't, I have to make sure to proactively ask my customer, what do you want me to do here? How do you want me to handle the case when it isn't a bright sunny day? The error code paths are often harder to test than the non-error paths. You know, as I joke, you know, let's start a runaway nuclear chain reaction and see if the error handling catches it, you know? Um, you, you sometimes can't set these things up. And so you're like, well, I'm going to have to create whole new mocking systems. And if you don't know what those are, you should take the brand new Active Framework class when it becomes available in January. Um, okay, and, uh, I'm pretty sure January. <laughs> um, the, but you, you have to you know, change how you're even gonna be able to plug these things together in order to inject an error into the system and see if it really does properly turn on the UI, report to the log, stop the hardware, safe the, the laser, all these different pieces that have to happen when an error goes off. That's all a big ask and most unit tests will fail to test those cases. Um, 
I am one of the world's worst on unit testing. You can, you can ask my fellow developers. I, but you know, I do know enough to try and make sure that at least inject an error and see if that actually causes a problem. Um, Cause often it doesn't. We code for the happy path. That is our nature. And I don't know if that's because it's a generational thing of training and the, you know, that we could fix it by training the generation that's currently in high school differently. Or if it's just fundamental to human nature, that's one of those things that the professors are gonna to have to research on teaching. But I'm telling you right now, look at your unhappy cases. And I'll bet you in the large portions of your code, you're gonna find places where you've just dropped the air wire or didn't handle it or just assumed it would be good. All right, so these things are special. This concept is part of what drives errors to become a language feature and not a library feature. Several years ago, uh, we had something that we like to call the Great Recession in the United States and partially the rest of the world when Lehman Brothers melted down and a whole bunch of people were out of work. And uh, at the same time, I had developed a brand new version of error.llb that you could replace on disk and it gave entirely new behaviors to the air, entire error handling system of LabVIEW. And I thought it was pretty cool. I showed up at the CLA summit and I couldn't get National Instruments to buy in on it. And they were like, we don't really want to play with that. We're not sure if that's really the way we want to deliver it. We're a little bit distracted right now with some other things that were going on. Put it on the back burner. And I was like, okay, why don't you make it available for download? People could just replace it in their own copy. And they would have, you know, be able to use this new augmented thing. And then we would get some usability data about it, right? Well, I had some folks who were out of work at the time among this crowd and you know your peers, uh, and some of you were willing to say, were willing to say, sure, I'll try it out. And they downloaded my RLLB, replaced their copy in VI lib, and very quickly discovered that you can't replace RLLB and use all these new features and still use third-party libraries. Because error, the concept of error, and then the physical embodiment of error and the capacities of error have to be ubiquitous in a programming environment. And they were like, it seems nice and I can use it in my little toy projects, but I sure as heck can't deploy it. And so it went on the back burner and it's, it's kind of languished. And some of the pieces that were in there are now what's in LabVIEW 2020. Not all of it, but some pieces are there. But my point is, these things happen so much and are so frequent that in every language I know, error becomes special because you get tired of typing, if function returns false, then. If function returns false, then, you know, and, and testing every step of the way. And you develop some sort of syntax, which as we do with the railroad tracks and with the specialized behavior of the case structure, so you don't have to keep unbundling the status code, et cetera, just to handle errors. It can completely change the whole pattern of your coding. These error handling patterns develop, you get you know, typical structures, you get people requesting, hey, can we wire the air wire directly to the stop terminal of a while loop? You get special coercion behaviors because really they should be part of the Boolean logic on a regular basis. All of these things, the error behavior starts accreting um, because we use it a lot. And it's not a bad thing. I don't want you to say, oh, well, Stephen said, no, stop using errors or something. Uh, that's not my point. I want you thinking about your errors. I want you conscious about this thing that is so ubiquitous, it's like breathing air. And I need you to stop and occasionally go, yep, still breathing. Yeah, okay. Uh, did I breathe correctly? Yeah, oh, okay. And then you can go back to breathing uh, you know, autonomously. Same with the air wiring. One change, as I was mentioning on the previous slide, in the error reporting requirements, one need to put that Boolean on the, on the screen can change the entire system. Um, why does the radio module know about the tire balance sensors in this vehicle? I am not going to tell you whether this is a real world scenario or not. And the answer is, well, that's the display, only display panel we have for user status and it needed an LED to show whether the tires are out of balance. So somebody gave the radio direct knowledge of the tire pressure system. And those systems became tightly coupled together and refactoring became that much harder. Got it. All right. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna move a little bit faster then. Um, I've covered this before, air handling, five different parts of air handling. Uh, I have entire presentations, you can go look them up online. Um, don't just talk about air handling, talk about your pieces. 
When you're designing for error codes, treat it as a need to know basis. Does your application, uh, you know, design your application around your error propagation. Think first about what the fail cases are. Start from those. If module X fails, who cares? Who needs to be aware of that? Because that's gonna definitely draw one of your communication paths and everything else will want to follow close to those. By focusing on the error cases, we can avoid even creating the unsolvable edge cases and corner cases. So instead of let's just get something working, let's just get something failing. If you start there, then you're gonna be on a sounder ground. And I've been doing this lately in a lot of my design work. It, it seems healthier. This applies even at the design level, or at, sorry, at the diagram level. You know, think about, well, I, I wrote the header information in the file, I do some work, the tail info needs to go in there even if the middle part decided to stop writing. So I need to branch that around. So I had to think, who needs to know about each of the errors in that chain? And because and, if I put this in line there, this, this node will skip its behavior, it won't run on an error. And then I get a file that's not complete. Consider all of the, the different cases that we've pointed out earlier. The telescope UI did not care about the errors from Zoom because it was pre-checking the inputs. So I was able to, I could design that without worrying about the error and I can take a different route. Um, but it needs a pre-check function. Holy cow, that's a whole different, you know, pre-flight. The referee could have waited indefinitely unless we propagated the error. Oh, okay, he apparently does need that. The kingdom could not be saved without deep knowledge of horseshoes. And the Canon would not be able to rake in money from ink sales if it didn't propagate the errors to the scanner. Again, I may be lambasting them and libeling them, but it's a little suspicious. Some final recommendations. Eliminate your excess error terminals. Uh, we've recently had some discussions on LinkedIn about that. Uh, don't bother with error in if the function doesn't have side effects beyond computation. The unbundle by name doesn't have error. The mod function doesn't have error. It's got other ways of returning problems. Don't bother with error out if the function encodes its data in some other way, like not a number for double. You can indeed have an error out without an error in. And if you're writing uh, protected scope dynamic dispatch VIs, this is a very good idea because it means every person who overrides it doesn't need to worry about whether or not there was an error upstream. It just assumes that was handled or I wouldn't have been called. And it gets rid of a whole bunch of case structures. Do not use warnings. This is my recommendation. You can still use them, they're there. I put them into the air ring. Yeah, see, yeah, it's there. Don't. Um, they're, hard to be, they're hard to be aware of. People don't even know that this is a thing that could possibly be returned. You can go years without realizing, oh, there's a warning. Um, they're easily dropped in the data flow. They, you, they don't trigger automatic air handling. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> propagating warnings can create extra data flow dependencies. You know, you serialize things that should be running in parallel. Um, and warnings are generally local carabouts. I'm going to finish this out before I get questions. Okay. And then the last one is recontextualize at modular boundaries. So when you're returning an error from inside a library to the caller outside the library, messaging between parallel operations, well, you know, between these two loops, or sending a message across the network, these are module boundaries. And at each one of these, ask yourself the question, should this be a point where the function translates the low-level error into something the caller will actually understand and care about? Frequently, you do want to just propagate it, but sometimes you want to annotate it with some extra additional information, and you start adding the append tags uh, to the error cluster and using some of the tools that are in the palettes for augmenting an error, or you flatten it out to a, a separate string and you know, nest its information. Those boundaries are the moments when the context is shifting, when you're moving from inside of a space where everybody kind of knows what we're talking about and we don't really care what failed, we just know that something in here failed, and, but if I look at that error, I, I know what this space is. And as soon as you're crossing into a new context, you need to give them the information about yourself. I'm the source of the error. I'm part of the problem. It's a piece of me, not the whole of the problem. And that is the only helpful teaching I'm gonna to give today. My hope is that some of this, and looking at these cases that I've been able to pull out, some of them from your own code or that of your peers, some of it from my own experiences, has given you enough to think about these things. And we'll see what happens. Do we have time for questions? So is it okay to ignore that little free label that we've all seen a lot of times that says, wire this error wire across even in the no error case? Ah, um, 
So if you read the rest of that text, uh, it talks about uh, the pro it talks about the propagation of warnings, um, and I I don't always wire it across. Um, I, I we put that in there 15 years ago. I was a different programmer back then. I had a different opinion on code correctness and also on the appropriateness of warning, and I didn't yet have buy-in from National Instruments to stop using them in general. Uh, it's still not a blanket policy across NI. I don't mean to speak for my peers, but our style guide does say, avoid this. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't. If I'm doing something that's really low level library, like an actor framework that I know is gonna have ubiquitous usage, I'll take that extra time and I'll make sure they propagate in case there's a warning in the system, but I don't in general application code. Derek deletes my wires if I do draw them anyway. Next question. Yeah, so um, there's several different kind of interesting ideas. I guess the first one that I would offer is like thinking of instead of the word error, thinking of exception, like something happened that I didn't expect. It was exceptional. And then if something happened in code that I didn't expect, I can't really handle it if I don't even know what it was because it was passed to me from a lower level. Right. So I'm going to pass it up so that whoever's in the application that knows the context can figure out how to handle it potentially. Right. And, and so, so sometimes they get more context as it goes up. They're more aware. And sometimes they get less context as they go up. So yeah. And so if, if, I, if I see something exceptional in my application and I can handle it, it no longer becomes an error for me, right? right. I, I, it's not even an error. I just try to handle it and maybe pass it out as a Boolean or something like that. I very much like this idea. I would not use the term exception, if only because in the three other major programming languages, exception is the same as error, and it, you know they do yeah. ex ex but no. it is unusual, unexpected behavior. Yeah, I think just the word for me yep. affects kind of how I think about it. The other is around, well, there's two things. One is how NXG does errors, or at least the GWeb development. So it essentially like stops everything. So, or if there is an uncaught error, instead of automatic error handling, what do you wanna do? It just stops. Mm -hmm. And what I'm kind of wondering is, so in other like text-based sequential languages, you wrap these in like a try-catch, right? Mm -hmm. And so if there was some way, like when I do a call to basically say, here's a call and I actually, I don't want you to keep executing if there's an uncaught error, I actually want you to stop this whole chain and then let me do this other frame or something. Someday when we have about an hour to an hour and a half, ask me about error berets and error yeah. ball caps. And so um, we've, we've talked about different ways of doing that sort of escalation. I don't know if the web toolkit could introduce it. Um, I don't yeah. know how specialized they are. So I'm, I'm kind of curious too, like, so like a lot of ideas, like I kind of feel like a lot of us have been kind of like sitting on for the past 10 years while the idea exchange was kind of growing moss, yep. right? And so it'd be very interesting to have some kind of forum working group for like, could we all just kind of decide on a new error handling framework? And if everybody starts using it and using these in our tools, then maybe we wouldn't have that problem. The and problem is you have that one actually does. It, you'll find the same problem I ran into with trying to change error that will be in isolation. It will have to be an NI changes. No, no. Yeah, I get it. Um, but yes, getting some some discussion going on that sort of thing would be helpful. And was that also was that like error objects that you were working on? Or um, something? So I, I had ways of, of encoding the objects into the error cluster because yeah. I don't think we can break the binary compatibility. We had a shot at it with NXG as everything was being rewritten across. To make the error an object? To make the error anything other than the three current values that it currently is in a cluster. And they ran into problems with, there were so many DLLs written that mm -hmm. took that as a cluster or returned it or just side effects um, that even with a complete rewrite of every VI happening at the boundary, they found it yeah. difficult. Well, I don't so think we have an option. So what I built was the ability to code the objects into the flattened string. Okay and extend it and create an in inheritance hierarchy in that chain. Because LabVIEW, when it loads the, like code, right? If we like adopted like errors or objects and I can actually like create my own child classes to specialize these things and yep. like 
it could be possible for NI to write the hooks that when you open a VI and it's got legacy stuff, mm -hmm. it could add adaptation. Yep. Right. So I think it would require kind of like a working group to work together to decide officially what we want and then NI to kind of take the lead on the undercarriage. Something along those lines. Okay. Um, I suspect this is one where if it was going to have any wheels at all, you're going to need NI to take the lead on it because the driver groups are going to be what's the, the, the heaviest hand on, on any movement there.